Uh, my name is Raymond Kim, and I'm a senior at, here at UNC. Uh, and I, for the past two semesters, I looked into variance reduction in Monte Carlo methods, uh, and towards the end, a specific application into global illumination. Um, so for a brief history and background, the phrase Monte Carlo method was first referred into this paper, the Monte Carlo method, by Metropolis and Ulam back in 1947. And this was when uh, a team of scientists were working on the Manhattan Project and they wanted to simulate nuclear particles and now they interacted with one another. And in order to do this, they had to solve a set of integral differential equations. Um, which were really hard to solve, uh, and closed form solutions were practically unobtainable. So instead, what they did was they uh, sampled just single chains of events and was able to gain an approximation that way. Um, so the general definition uh, of a Monte Carlo method would be just a numerical method of solving problems through simulating random variables. Uh, and we can say um, doing these by hand were very uh, tedious, so this method became more and more popular uh, through the advent of computers and personal computing power. Um, so we can say that the general objective is to find some unknown mean mu uh, for some random variable x or transformation of a random variable x. Uh, and this is equivalent in evaluating the integral over some domain omega uh, if x is pulled from a PDF p. Um, so the first example is a very trivial method. We want to first, let's say we want to uh, approximate this area S within some domain. And we say this domain is just the unit square. Um, and honestly, the boundary can be anything. But we form an approximation by sampling this domain. Uh, and we say the number of points in S over the number, or we take the number of points in S and then the number of total points. And then we gain an approximation that way. And that's pretty simple to understand. Um, by doing this, if we do 40 points, uh, we count 13 points are in the square or in the region, and then we get an approximation of 0 0.325, where that, whereas the actual area, if we use the coordinates, is uh, 0 0.3077. Um, and then for 100 samples, like the relative error goes down quite a bit. Um, the next one is just simply defining or evaluating a definite integral. Um, we could analytically do this pretty easily, but just for the sake of example, if we define f to be this function and we want to find the integral from 0 to 1 in respect to dx and dy, uh, essentially what we'll do is we'll sample just random points in of f um, n, n number of times and then just take the mean of those, which is pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, visually speaking, um, to the left we have like kind of like the heat map of F, and then if we take a hundred samples, we get kind of uh, in practice we just take the average of all those samples to get an approximation of what the integral would be. Um, for like low dimensions, low dimensional or integrals, there's like a lot more. There's a lot better ways to do uh, evaluating those. Um, so specifically, Monte Carlo methods would be helpful if we're wanting to evaluate like higher dimensional integrals. Um, so the main main topic is looking into various redu variance reduction techniques. And first, we'll go through kind of why we want them, and then four different uh, popular ways to do so. Um, the first theorem that I want to mention uh, is the law of large numbers. This is essentially telling us how or why the Monte Carlo method works. Um, basically, it tells us that if we take um, the sum of n number of uh, random variables pulled from a distribution, then the average of those would uh, converge to the um, true expectation as n goes to infinity. And then the second theorem, uh, which is some it's pretty similar. It essentially states that if we take, again, n number of samples from a distribution, then the sum of that would resemble a normal distribution with um, expectation n times mu and variance of n times sigma squared. Um, so again, the general objective is to find some expectation. Uh, the basic case is which what, what, we'll, what we will be comparing it to is just taking the plain average of all those samples. Um, and we're just, we're just assuming it's just the samples are pulled from like a uniform distribution. Uh, and if we evaluate the variance, uh, we get sigma squared over n. Uh, when we talk about rate of convergence, we usually talk about standard deviation. So if we take the square root of this, we'll say that the rate of convergence for this basic method would be just um, big O of 1 over square root of n. And we'll be comparing that to some of the other techniques.
The first technique is using antithetic variates. Um, essentially, the key idea is behind pairing these samples with a negatively correlated sample. Um, and since we're kind of, I might go, or I'll skip some of the math because it might be, take a while, but uh, essentially we define y to be kind of like the average of these two. Um, so if we, if we take the average, we'll be sampling like half the number of samples. Um, and if we evaluate the variance of it, we get this correlation factor. Um, and if x and x prime are negatively correlated, then this covariance uh, term is less than zero, and then our overall variance goes down. Um, there's no general method in finding good antithetic pairs, so it really depends on the situation that you're in um, and what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Uh, the next is important sampling. Uh, if we say we want to evaluate some integral f over a domain A, uh, the idea is behind choosing samples not uniformly, but from a density function that's similar to f, uh, so that we'd be more likely to pick samples that are, uh, have like a high contribution to um, the integrand. Um, this is just a workthrough of kind of how this or why this works. Uh, we just redefine i to be the expectation of f of x over p of x. Um, and then we just form an estimator by just taking the average and then it was shown that the variance is most reduced when p of x is uh, proportional to f of x. And we can kind of see this if, uh, if we get like the best approximator uh, where p of x is just sort of constant times the function of x, uh, then essentially we'll be taking the variance of a constant, which is zero. But practically speaking, it's very hard to find a good probability density function because most of the cases, f is, um, we, it'll be like a black box function or some really complex function. Um, so we just shoot for something, it would be ideal to find a prob probability density function that's close to f. Um, this third one is pretty common, stratified sampling. Essentially, we want to divide up the uh, sample space into different subregions and then combine the results from each uh, region. Uh, and I kind of skipped the math, but essentially this works because we're reducing the variance <laughs> between each uh, local subregion. Uh, and this, this solves an issue known as sample clumping. Um, if we're pulling them from a random distribution, uh, we can face an issue where samples can be clustered or clumped near each other, uh, like we see in like the bottom right, where uh, versus like empty areas like in the middle or the top center. Um, and in the right, we can subdivide the area into like 25 squares with four samples each, and we can kind of see that it's a lot more spread out uh, than it is uh, versus the regular case. The fourth one, uh, quasi Monte Carlo methods. Um, it's a little bit different from the rest because we're not pulling them from a random distribution, but instead we'll be using a low discrepancy sequence, which essentially, which essentially are deterministic sequences that kind of uh, have behavior of random variables. Um, and generating these usually involve getting like prime numbers and like uh, different bases and whatnot. Uh, and a few famous ones are like the Halton sequence or like the Hammersley sequence. Um, but it was shown that the rate of convergence is log n um, to the s power over n for some dimension s, and we're taking n samples. So in order for this to be really effective, we need some high number of n and a fairly low dimension s. Um, and here, we're, this is just a visualization. From the left, we have uh, samples that are picked uniformly uh, from zero to one. And then in the middle, we have the Halton sequence. So we can kind of see it's like, it's evenly spread out, um, but not like too even, as we can see on the right, on the very right. So from the left, this would be something that has like high discrepancy, middle would be low discrepancy, and then the uh, right side would be zero discrepancy. So the application I kind of wanted to look into is global illumination, where we want to generate these like photorealistic images, and um, we do so by kind of keeping track of all the light that goes within the scene. Um, and to do this, we solve the rendering equation. And we just forget about all the variables. Uh, we're just essentially, <laughs> when we want to calculate the light at a given point, we um, take the sum of the light that's being emitted from that point and the integral of the bidirectional reflectance distribution function uh, multiplied by the incoming radiance uh, with some scalar factor and we integrate this over omega which is the hemisphere oriented about that surface normal and we'll do this in respect to um, all the light rays that are coming in.
Um, and to do so, we have some common ways are ray tracing and path tracing, um, which you guys might be familiar with. But in ray tracing, we'll just, the very basic case, um, what we'll do is we'll shoot rays from the camera into each pixel of the image plane, and then we'll intersect that with the scene. And at each intersection, we'll see if it's like exposed to a light source. And if it is, then we'll add that to the overall radiance. And if it isn't, we won't. Uh, so we can get like effects such as shadows. And if we implement like a recursive ray tracer, then we could get like reflected or like mirror-like effects. Um, but the problem with this is that we can only calculate direct lighting. Um, so effects such as like soft shadows or uh, like ambient occlusion and whatnot uh, that come from indirect lighting, we won't be able to achieve. Uh, which is where path tracing comes into play. Uh, and in path tracing, essentially, for every pixel, we'll shoot thousands, if not tens of thousands of samples. Uh, and then instead of checking whether or not it's exposed to a light, we'll bounce that about the scene for a set number of times. Uh, and if it ends up reaching a light source, we'll calculate that into the overall radiance. Um, Practically speaking, we, we say we uh, bounce it once, but if we want to solve this integral, um, as briefly mentioned, we want to sample these or, like uniformly about the hemisphere. Um, but that takes like a lot of calculations to do, especially if we're doing like tens of thousands of samples. Uh, it'll in increase exponentially if we like take five, five rays and then take the average of those. Um, so when it comes to variance and reduction techniques, uh, variance usually comes in the form of visual artifacts. Uh, the first one is noise, which kind of comes from the whole idea of using random numbers uh, and then aliasing. Um, th I think the most popular method to do variance reduction in global illumination is stratified sampling, where we kind of divide up the hemisphere into subregions and evenly sample the hemisphere. Um, but nowadays, people are looking more into using quasi Monte Carlo methods and using like these low discrepancy sequences in order to sample the hemisphere. Um, but the problem that can appear from that is that the, based on the way that these sequences are generated, they're kind of periodic in nature. So uh, we could end up getting like these aliasing effects, which isn't as bad as what we see on the right. I just included that to kind of see kind of like the weird patterns that we could get. Um, so what I just, this is just a proposal, like a proof of concept of what I had in mind. Um, we're assuming that we want to calculate the light at a perfectly diffuse surface, which means that we want to sample the hemisphere uniformly. Um, just regular quasi Monte Carlo methods uh, would, could bring in some uh, aliasing, so we want to add in some variance. Um, some of the challenges that we face is that we have to be very meticulous with the number of computations that we're doing, because these will be done like millions or if not billions of times. Um, so um, we want to first generate a 3D and 2D low discrepancy sequence, and we'll call this A and B. Um, then for each sample in A, we discard all the ones that are outside of the sphere. So instead of like a point cloud uh, cube, we get a point cloud sphere, and we do this for B as well. And then what we'll end up doing is we'll normalize A so that all these points are projected onto the surface of the sphere, and then we could either like exclude the ones that are below, since we're trying to sample a hemisphere instead of a sphere, um, or we could just flip it up. Uh, we'll find a vector orthogonal to A sub i, and we'll call this u, and then take the pros cross product to get v, and this will act as a basis of some sorts. And then we'll adjust u and v depending on the number of samples that we're taking. And then our new sample would be this, where A sub i would just be the sample based off of the regular quasi Monte Carlo method, or like low discrepancy sequence, and then this, these, the second, the second and third term would be some kind of variation, um, and potential problems might be the amount of normalizing that we're doing. Uh, square roots are pretty expensive, uh, especially if we're trying to do this like billions of times. Um, Resources-wise, I don't have like access to like the computing power in order to like efficiently test like uh, taking several samples across this hemisphere. Um, so that was one of the problems. And then for future work, I think it would be nice to kind of formalize this and be able to uh, implement this in an actual manner. Any questions? Y'all may be interested in knowing that Halston was on our faculty until he retired. And ray tracing was invented by Turner Whitted, who's an agent. Mm -hmm. So you're building on, on, on <laughs>